Great. Thanks for joining us uh, this uh, early morning for day two of Showcase. Uh, in the Brain Def TV program, we have several major scientific goals over the next few years. Uh, first off, uh, we want to understand how visual information is encoded in the cortex of the mouse brain. And we're particularly interested in uh, several key cortical regions in the back of the brain here that correspond to the visual cortex. So we use a rich uh, diversity of visual stimuli to characterize how individual cells encode uh, visual features of the world. And ultimately, we seek a cell type level description such that we can build uh, realistic models of the cortical column that can reproduce uh, the sensory spo responses that we measure in vivo. Going beyond sensory encoding, we're interested in understanding how uh, visual information is used to guide behavior. For example, in this schematic of a behavioral task at the top right here, a mouse is presented with sequential flashes of a visual scene, and the job of the mouse is to respond when the scene changes. We want to understand how visual information flows through the cortical network, is processed by the visual areas, and ultimately leads to decisions and motor actions based on that sensory input. To address these questions, we're building brain observatories that allow us to map activity in the mouse brain in a systematic way uh, using standardized um, and comprehensive methodology. In the last team talk that you'll hear about today, at the end of the day, uh, you'll uh, learn about the two-photon imaging brain observatory, which launched this year in 2016. Uh, here's a uh, uh, snapshot from the website. Uh, this data has, has been released online prior to publication. Uh, what you'll hear about today in our talk is our developing plans for a new brain observatory based on electrophysiological recordings. Now, e electrophysiology or EFIS is highly complementary to calcium imaging. And some of the major strengths are its exquisite temporal precision and its sensitivity to single spikes, to very high signal to noise. So the organization of the talk today will highlight some of the uh, unique features or complementary features of electrophysiological recordings. So you'll hear from Dan Denman, who will uh, describe the development of the neuropixel probes, which uh, provide an unprecedented access to measure single cells uh, with high temporal resolution. Severine Durand will talk about some of the temporal features of these EFIS recordings. Sam Gale will uh, highlight some data that shows how we can record from deep structures in the mouse brain with the neuropixel probes in a very dense way to produce maps of uh, visual responses. And then finally, uh, Josh Siegel will talk about our efforts to scale these recordings to simultaneously measure activity in multiple brain regions uh, uh, in a coordinated way. And then also uh, a challenging uh, uh, goal, which is to link uh, electrical recordings with cell type information. So with that, I'll hand it over to Dan. Okay, thanks, Sean. Um, so uh, a first step in, in building this platform is assessing the, the available technology and um, really what's needed to, to accomplish the scientific requirements. Um, the first scientific requirement, temporal resolution, is a, a given with, with the, the technique. Um, and the second one, depth resolution, is really um, pretty easily accomplishable with, with um, commercially available probes they are able to record from structures deep in the brain. It's this last one, the ability to record from large distributed populations of many single neurons where um, commercially available probes and, and even developmental probes uh, don't live up to the task and, and um, certainly didn't a few years ago when this consortium was formed to develop a new extracellular, extracellular electrophysiology uh, probe called the NeuroPixels probe. So we at the Allen Institute are a member of this consortium along with other uh, research and funding institutions, probably most importantly, IMEC, which is a semiconductor foundry in Belgium where these probes are, are actually manufactured. 
So what I want to do now is go through a sort of um, breezy history of the development and assessment phases of this um, NeuroPixels Pro project, sort of keeping in mind these probe requirements, uh, which were important during the development, um, and trying to circle back to um, this last technical challenge, um, can we develop a new probe that can record from large populations? So, so many, many single neurons, hopefully many hundreds of single neurons. Um, okay, so let's keep these probe requirements in mind and go through the, the design phases. So in the first phase, we focus just on the individual sites of these electrodes. Um, so you can see a, a diagram of the whole probe here and, and the multi-shanks of this first phase one probe in which we focused on these, um, these sites, which you can see in the electron micrograph here. These are titanium nitride sites. And the most important thing, since these are a relatively new material for, for this type of technology, was to make sure that they had low power um, and they were stable, um, which we were able to, to test during this phase. And by stable, we really mean that they're biocompatible. We can put them in brains and they don't fall apart. Um, so this was successful. We moved on to the second phase where we took these sites and arranged them on a single shank that is um, somewhat similar to what we hope the final product to be. So you can see um, some of these individual sites now arranged on one single shank on this diagram of the probe. And uh, sort of most importantly in this phase, we added electronics within this, within this shank to provide some of the functionality, which I'll describe <laughs> later. Um, and uh, by adding those electronics, we had uh, wanted to test a few more of these probe requirements while maintaining the, these things we'd, we'd already validated, um, primarily low power since we added electronics and uh, experimental feasibility. Do these shanks um, still go into the brain and do they not break the brain when we, when we put them in? Um, so not only did we pass that bar, but we got some really good um, high quality actual scientific data using these, these phase two probes. And that uh, encouraged us moving on to, to phase three, which is very close to the complete and final package, which uh, looks like this. So these are the um, final parameters uh, of the NeuroPixels probes. You can see a, a whole probe over here. It's a few, a few centimeters. At the end, there's a 10 millimeter shank, which is completely covered in those sites that I described from phase one. Uh, and under each site, um, there, are there are electronics that allow the, the sites to be individually addressable. So of the, of the 966 sites that cover this 10 millimeter shank, any 384 can be read out, depending on which, which ones the users want. So you could choose 384 channels down here at the tip. You could choose 100 at the tip, 100 in the middle, and 184 at the top, sort of um, as your heart desires or as the brain dictates. Um, and in the end, what you have is um, a data stream read out at 30 kilohertz that produces about one gigabyte of data per minute. Um, so this brings us to the actual scientific challenge. Okay, you've got one gigabyte per minute, but how do you get many single neurons out of it? Um, so if you take a, a small chunk of raw data here, just from the tip of the probe in just a few milliseconds, you can see events where there are individual spikes like this one uh, that spans a few channels and this one that uh, appears just on one channel. Unfortunately, the sort of typical techniques that existed in the field uh, to process this data into, into individual spike times were totally infeasible for data of this scale. It took about two months to process a two-hour recording. Um, and thankfully, a, a byproduct of this consortium has been the development of, of the software tools required to, to work with this large-scale electrophysiology data. So the first is the algorithmic set, um, which is an implementation of a template matching algorithm by a group at University College. College London that allows us to identify the spike times in the recording and assign them to, to putative single units. So, so this spike may have come from unit number one and this unit number three, and then we go through the whole recording and, and we assign, the, assign them. We get unit one and unit three. Unfortunately, it's not perfect, even though it took our processing time down from two months to two hours. Uh, we still have a manual step where we have to go in and look at the spike waveforms of individual units, like a couple I show here, and this, the spike times to say, okay, these things that the algorithm found are, are not good, we're gonna throw them away, and, and these things are good, we'll keep them. We'll put them into our standardized um, neurophysiological data format, partially developed here at the Institute, Neurodata Without Borders, and then we can get to our question, how many single neurons do we actually record? Um, and so here's an example of 106 uh, neurons shown on the y-axis here, recorded simultaneously in V1 in just a, a few seconds of their spike times. Um, so 106 is a pretty reasonable number. It's on the high end, but it's um, close to what you can expect from, from uh, a sensory cortex, like primary visual cortex. We get between 70 and 100 neurons every time we put our next neuropixels probe in the brain. We've gotten really great yield um, uh, in any, every brain structure that, that we, we um, put the probes in, getting uh, a couple hundred neurons on average across the whole probe. Just for some context, comparing um, a similar uh, commercially available probe, single shank that covers a single structure, um, it's not a, quite an order of magnitude improvement, but it's about a 5x improvement in the number of single neurons that, that we can record. 
um, with a single shank. So we're really excited about um, the quality of the data that these probes produce. I want to hand it over to the rest of the team now to talk about some of the science that we have done uh, and are planning to do. Starting with Sev, we'll talk about the, um, the temporal resolution of extracellular EFIS. So one major attribute that makes electrophysiology a very powerful technique is its high temporal resolution. So to illustrate that high temporal resolution is crucial in understanding the, um, the response to visual stimulation, uh, I'm showing here different types of response to visual stimulation uh, observed with different <coughs> techniques. So uh, with behavior where you report leaks, uh, the stimuli are in gray. <coughs> Uh, o is where you report a change in calcium signal, and E is where you um, report a change in uh, firing rate. So to start with uh, behavior, the task here is uh, to detect changes in natural images. And uh, when, the detect, uh, when they uh, detect uh, change, uh, they um, make a leak. So here you can see, as indicated by the red line, that the first uh, leak that we observed are happening around 300 milliseconds after the onset of the stimulus. Um, now in EFIS, you can see that um, uh, it, it peaks basically at the same time as the first leaks happens, and it's a slow signal, uh, meaning that it peaks uh, after the removal of the stimulus. Well, when you look at uh, EFIS, uh, you can see that the maximum firing rate happens during the stimulation and presents interesting dynamics. So basically, if you want to explain what's happening here before a decision is made or before a leak is made, uh, electrophysiology is a great candidate to help you understand that. Now, uh, another advantage of electrophysiology is the fact that we can record from all cortical depth uh, at the same time. If you want to understand the flow of information uh, in a cortical column, um, you need to understand the flow of information, uh, the dynamics with, within and uh, between layers. Um, so cortical cells respond uh, differently to uh, stimuli. So for, for example, here two cells, cell one, cell two, that respond differently. We plot here the firing rate as a function of time and increase the stimulation. And you have an early response cell and a late response cell. Now to quantify this for every cell, we measure the time to peak, which is the delay between the onset of the stimulus to the maximum firing rate. Now if you um, average all these traces for many mice and um, many cells, uh, for layer two, three, and four, and here layer five and six, you obtain these uh, green and uh, purple traces. Uh, the major difference here is this prominent initial early peak uh, that you can see in the middle layers uh, indicating that a lot of cells respond early that is not observed in deep layers. And this difference is even more obvious if you uh, plot the distribution of time to peak. Um, like cells in uh, middle layers tend to respond between 50 and 100 milliseconds while uh, cells in the deep layers respond between uh, 100 and 150 milliseconds. So basically we can come up with very preci precise information about layers and this of course will be investigated uh, in depth uh, during the pipeline. Um, now electrophysiology is not only restricted to the cortex and Sam is going to talk now about targeting deep structures. So one of the deep structures in the brain that we're very interested in is the thalamic nucleus LP, shown here in the middle of the brain. And LP is, is interesting for a couple of reasons. Um, one of the major outputs of the retina to the superior colliculus reaches, um, the information reaches visual cortex through LP. LP also receives input from visual cortex, and this serves as an indirect route between, by which visual cortical areas can communicate <coughs> with each other. Uh, we don't know a whole lot about LP at this point, but one major question is how many functionally distinct um, 
uh, subregions does it contain? And so we expect the LP contains at least one orderly map of visual space. And, and this schematic here, the visual scene is, is Mount Rainier. And in this example, low, low elevations of the scene are represented in one area of LP, and high elevations are represented in another area. And we can represent any axis of the visual map in LP, such as elevation, with color. So here I'm showing low elevation in blue and high elevation in red. But another possibility is that LP contains multiple maps of visual space. So in this example, uh, neurons in two different regions of LP represent the same portion of space, but those neurons might differ in their connectivity and in their function. So to map the representation of, of visual space in LP, we present flashing stimuli at various locations, and we record uh, which locations in space a given neuron um, responds to, and we call that region the, neur the neuron's receptive field. Each of these bubbles over here is, is the receptive field of an individual LP neuron, color-coded by the elevation that that neuron responds to. Um, and during the experiment, we also coat the NeuroPixels probe with red dye. So now we have information about where each of these neurons is located in LP and where it responds to in visual space. Uh, and we can combine this information to create a three-dimensional map of the representation of visual space in LP um, using the common coordinate framework brain. And so here's what that looks like for our preliminary data set. And you can see that there's transitions from regions of LP representing low elevation, shown in blue, to regions representing higher elevations in red. And something interesting that pops out is it appears, at least it's suggestive so far, that there's two uh, separate maps in LP. So a region from representing low elevation to high elevation here, and another transition from low elevation to high, elev high elevation over here. And the region where these two uh, maps meet in the middle of LP corresponds really closely to the border in LP of the, of the region of LP that receives input from the sphere click list and the region that only receives input from visual cortex. And so we're very interested to, to discover how um, neurons in each of these regions of LP differ in their function. It would be particularly informative if we could record from both of these LP subregions and visual cortex simultaneously. So now Josh is going to talk about how we can make that kind of experiment possible. <coughs> So Sam just gave us a great example of how we can use the long length of neural pixels probes to record from deep structures, but we can also take advantage of this length to record from multiple brain areas simultaneously. Because the sites are spread out over almost 10 millimeters, or sorry, yeah, 10 millimeters, um, we can stick a single shank through superficial and deep structures and record uh, from all the areas in between. So for example, we've already done several experiments in which we stick a single shank through primary visual cortex down into LP or down into lateral geniculate nucleus, and we're able to record uh, visual responses on, in, in both of these connected structures simultaneously. However, if we want to record from multiple cortical regions, it's usually not sufficient to have a single probe in the brain. Uh, in this case, we need to use multiple probes to target different areas that are spread out uh, across the cortex. So the current um, Two-Photon Brain Observatory includes data from um, primary visual cortex as well as three higher visual areas, LM, AL, and PM. And uh, this is a diagram of how those areas are oriented on the surface of the cortex, and this is kind of a, a side view of the, the same areas. Now, in the upcoming NeuroPixels Brain Observatory, uh, we're also interested in recording from as many areas as possible, including many of the higher visual areas, but we're limited by the fact that we have to collect all of our data in a single experiment. So instead of recording one area at a time, as is done with the current two-photon brain observatory, uh, we're going to stick multiple neuropixels probes into the brain simultaneously. And uh, we can plan where these probes are going to go by doing uh, intrinsic signal imaging through um, intrinsic signal imaging to get the, the retinotopic maps. Um, and then we can align our probes to the center of each of these areas. 
And as a result, we will not only be able to measure the properties of cells within each area, um, but we'll also be able to look at real-time interactions between areas and across layers. And so um, we're, we're very excited about uh, the possibilities of these data sets and being able to monitor the flow of information through the cortex on a trial by trial basis. So it's taken a fair amount of technical development to make it possible to insert multiple probes simultaneously. Uh, to accomplish this, we partnered with New Scale Technologies, which is a, a company that manufactures tiny three-axis linear stages shown here. Um, and we gave our requirements to New Scale, and they delivered a complete insertion system capable of positioning uh, NeuroPixels probes with submicron accuracy. So each of these probes can be moved independently in order to target a specific visual area. So we're currently carrying out experiments using this new scale system. Uh, this is an example of some of the data that we've collected. So this is a single experiment where we have three, uh, sorry, four probes uh, almost fully inserted into a mouse brain. Um, the, these heat maps here show the density of neurons recorded on each channel. Um, and then these, um, these, each black dot represents one spike recorded during a 20-second interval, and all, all these probes are synchronized, so we're getting data simultaneously across um, 1,496 channels. And uh, the top of, of each electrode is located somewhere in cortex. Uh, the middle of the, the probes are in hippocampus or subiculum, and the, the tip of each probe is sticking down into thalamus. So we've only just begun to analyze the data from these multi-probe experiments, but we're extremely excited uh, by the richness of the information contained in these large-scale distributed spike trains. So at the same time, we are working with the engineering team to design a prototype production rig that we can use for brain observatory data collection starting in uh, 2018. And um, this is meant to be identical to the current rigs for um, the existing brain observatory, but instead of a, a two-photon microscope, we now have six neuropixels probes that are oriented towards the brain. And uh, these probes can be moved up and out of the way in order to insert and remove the mouse and then brought back down for the experiment. Um, this rig is currently in the design phase, but we're going to um, build a, a test rig in early 2017 and um, do uh, lots of testing and piloting um, over the next year. So the last thing I want to talk about is how we plan to relate the neuropixel data back to cell types. Um, first of all, we have very precise depth information in our recording, so we can use that to classify cells according to the layer that they're in. Um, but it's also very important to have some information about the genetic identity of the cells that we're recording from. So to do this, uh, we plan to use an opto-tagging method, whereby we cross uh, Cree mouse line with AA32 reporter line, um, and the AA32 line um, will ensure that channel rhodopsin is expressed in any neurons that express Cre, and then we can go and put a fiber optic cable um, in the vicinity of the neuropixels probe and illuminate the brain with blue light, and any neurons that are channel rhodopsin positive will be uh, directly depolarized by the light and uh, will fire high-frequency trains of action potential. So this is one example experiment in an SCNN1A Cre mouse. This is a uh, a neuron from layer four of primary visual cortex, and here where we, when we turn on the light in the sinus oil ramp, the cell starts to fire at almost 400 hertz, which is a very good indicator that it's uh, being directly activated by the light. And so we plan to do many uh, future experiments that include this optotagging technique with a uh, specific focus placed on cells that express interneuron markers such as parvalbumin, somatostatin, and VIP. So over the next year, in 2017, we will be building new rigs and uh, collecting pilot data in preparation for the uh, start of NeuroPixel's Brain Observatory data collection in 2018. At the same time, we will continue to collect lots of data for our research projects that use the NeuroPixel's probe, such as the ones that uh, Seb and, and Sam told you about. And looking further into the future, in, by 2019, we hope to be collecting NeuroPixels data in mice performing a visual task, so we can investigate the dynamic spike patterns that underlie behavior. And through these experiments, uh, we want to take advantage of the millisecond timescale temporal resolution of EFES in order to better understand how the mouse brain transforms visual stimuli into decisions. So I'd like to thank uh, Paul and Jody Allen for their support, and 
all the members of the Allen Institute who contributed to the development and testing of the neural pixels probes. So, thank you. So we have time for questions. I mean, you can basically make the tips touch. They, ha they have to come in at an angle, maybe like 15 to 20 degrees. So um, depending on how deep you want to go, you're limited um, by how close they can get. But yeah, you could definitely get three probes into V1. So th this hardware, temporal and um, spatial density, do you feel like this is all you need? You have sufficient temporal and spatial density for the task of Neurons, or do you wish you had more spatial density? Do you feel you're oversampling in time domain? I mean, is this kind of, not the last word, but sufficient for the task, or do you wish the next phase is uh, more wowy? So in terms of the spatial density of the recording sites on the probe itself, I think we're in pretty much an ideal situation right now, because um, each spike um, can be detected by um, somewhere between one and ten sites. Um, so having a higher density of sites doesn't really help us in terms of being able to distinguish nearby neurons. Uh, of course, we're, we're limited by the, the lateral um, distance. We, we only have two columns of sites. And so um, it, it makes it, it, it limits the, the range over which we can detect neurons in the vicinity of the probe. Of course, if we make the probe wider, then it does more damage to the brain. And so uh, that's something that we want to avoid. So I, I think in terms of the, the shank size, um, the current probes are pretty ideal. But um, obviously, the, the more neurons we can sample, the better. So if there, there's some other technology that is um, equally gentle in terms of it, how it, it penetrates the brain but can record from more neurons, I'm, I'm sure uh, we'd be interested in adopting it. And uh, in terms of temporal resolution, I think um, with the, we have a 30 kilohertz sampling rate, um, which I think is appropriate for the, the types of dynamics that, that we're looking to measure. I mean, we can, we can sample w within a single spike, um, we, we get like almost 20 samples of, of data. Um, so we can, we can see the spike waveforms very well. And so having even faster temporal resolution wouldn't, um, wouldn't help us that much. Can you move one probe while keeping the other probes in place, or do you lose all the neurons? If, for example, you were searching for two areas that were topographically aligned. You might want to move one probe, leaving the other probes in place. Does, is that possible, or? Yeah, all the probes can move independently, and obviously there's going to be some motion of the brain when uh, probes are moving through it, but as long as you give the, time, the brain time to settle, um, you can keep one probe stable while uh, moving the others, others around. Um, uh, two two uh, technical questions. One is um, you showed this mapping of receptive fields in the thalamic nucleus. So how do you um, take into account eye movements there? And my second question is, is that are you planning on making the neuropixel probe chronically implantable? It looked like this is all acute. So when, when you do the when you do the, the pipeline, presumably use a new one for every animal? Yeah, so I'll, I'll answer the second question and then Sam can answer the first. So um, the current version of the probe actually is chronically imp implantable. Uh, people have done chronic recordings in both mice and rats and have shown that the electrodes are stable over many months. Um, however, because of the size of the probe, if you're doing a chronic recording, you can only insert one at a time. Um, and we're really interested in looking at dynamic interactions between areas. So um, the, the best solution for us is to do these acute experiments. And in these cases, the, the probes are very reusable. Um, we can use uh, one probe for dozens of experiments. So we basically have uh, the same probes um, in a given configuration. And then um, for each mouse, we will target the probes to the particular visual areas that we want to record from and insert them just for that experiment. Um, so Sam, you want to take the eye movement question? <laughs> Yeah, so we have, uh, we do record the eye movements and we have tried correcting for, for them and seeing how what effect it has on the receptive fields. And at least for LP, which has 
pretty large receptive fields, 20, 40 degrees across, uh, it doesn't really make much of a difference, so, with our mapping. Yeah, I just have uh, two technical questions with the photo tagging experiments. Do you have issues with artifact, with Becquerel effect, with these probes when you photo stimulate? Um, and second, how do you deal, you have a lot of local connectivity in, your, in the circuits you're recording from, how do you deal with that for the photo tagging to make sure that you're actually recording from the channel where Dobson expressing cells and not something one synapse down? Yeah, so there's definitely a light artifact on these probes. It's not any worse than what you'd see with your typical silicon probes. Um, so there are ways to measure what it is and uh, make sure you're not um, interfering with, with real data. So uh, in the example that I showed, I used a, a sinusoidal ramp. Um, which I found is useful for um, identifying neurons in excitatory populations um, because uh, if you give a single pulse, you activate the, the whole circuit at once and you get a very high firing rate across the whole column. Um, and with these sort of gentler ramps, you both avoid any artifact in your data and also um, make it easier to pick out which cells are firing at, at very high rates uh, specifically to the light. Uh, with the inhibitory cell lines, it becomes a little bit easier because um, with each pulse, you're, you're shutting down nearby neurons. And so in that case, we can give small pulses. And uh, we do see a little artifact, but it's, um, it's easy to identify, and it doesn't interfere with our spike identification. So thank you uh, Thanks. very much. <laughs>